Welcome to Change It Up Radio here with Paula Shaw. I am so excited about this show today because you know we're on the eve of Veterans Day and I have a very, very special veteran to share with you. It's my dad, Jack Gutman, who is a veteran of the, a veteran from World War II who was in the Normandy invasion. So just let me get my time clock going here. Here we go. All right. Welcome to Change It Up Radio. And those of you who follow us, you know, we're about change. We're all about either spotlighting change makers who are trying to make the world a better place, or we're about bringing you information and stories of people who've done extraordinary things with change so that it can help you deal with change in a smoother, more productive way. And my guest today <clears throat> is somebody who's been pretty amazing dealing with change. From the very, very beginning of his young life, he was dealing with one of the biggest upheavals that has ever happened here on, on our planet, actually. So we'll be talking in just a little bit with my dad, Jack Gutman, who is a veteran of World War II. He was in both the Normandy invasion and Okinawa invasion. But less than a week ago, or actually just over a week ago, he had a stroke. And he's here with us today to do this interview. And I think you're gonna be pretty amazed at what you see. So before we get going, talking a little bit about all of that, I wanna remind everybody that if you would like information about Change It Up Radio, you can get that information and you can hear past episodes on changeitupradio.com. That's changeitupradio.com. And if you'd like information about me or my work as a life transition coach, an author, a speaker, and of course the host of this and uh, a couple of other podcasts, then you can get that information at paulashaw.com, paulashaw.com. There's also, by the way, a free gift on paulashaw.com of 20 things to say and not to say to people in pain, because those are very awkward moments for most of us when we're having that difficult conversation with someone who's dealing with upheaval in their life. And both dad and I know that very personally these days. We'll be sharing all about that very shortly. But also um, on Change It Up Radio, you can hear past episodes of the show. And on paulashaw.com, as I say, there is a free gift. And actually it was the very document that inspired my most recent book, Saying the Right Thing When You Don't Know What to Say. So please go there, please take advantage of that because it actually gives you 20 different statements to say and 20 different statements not to say. So that when you're having an emotional conversation or a conversation with someone who's been through something difficult, you'll feel so much more able to say the right things that can actually be helpful and healing. Because fragile people sometimes can be difficult to talk to. And, and what we often do is we don't talk to them because we're afraid we're going to make it worse. We're afraid we're going to say the wrong thing. So we avoid the phone call or we avoid the visit. And that person who's hurting probably needs that visit or that phone call more than ever before in their lifetime. And so I want all of you to feel capable and able to have those conversations and feel really competent that you know the right things to say, and you know the things to avoid saying. So please take advantage of that gift on paulashaw.com. Okay, we are about a week away from Veterans Day. And Veterans Day actually is one of my favorite holidays because it honors people who have made the ultimate sacrifice for the rest of us to keep us safe to keep America working the way we want it to work. 
Very often, these veterans have gone to war. Very often, they have experienced upheaval in their lives. They've had to leave their homes, their families, and, and they've been through traumatic events. Even if you don't get killed in a war scenario, seeing people you love get killed, seeing awful, heinous things happen that we're not prepared for. Nothing in our upbringing prepares us to see some horrific thing and not be impacted by it. And you know, so interesting on, uh, I do another podcast called Higher Energy that we produce for the Association for Comprehensive Energy Psychology. And this week, I was interviewing Dawson Church, who's written, just released a book called Bliss Brain. And one of the things I learned that I didn't really realize is that when the brain is not focused on a task, its default mode is worry. So isn't that interesting? What are we all saying all the time to each other these days? Be positive, think positive, keep your mind in a positive place. Well, guess what? That is not the norm. We actually have to work at being positive. We actually have to work at, at being able to keep our mind in that place because it's not the normal natural default. And why? Well, think about it. If ancient man hadn't constantly been thinking about how am I going to get meat for the family tomorrow or are we safe when the, the storm is howling like this or whatever, you know, there was always need to be kind of present and, and vigilant towards survival or you just didn't survive. And so I think it's really interesting because Sometimes survival puts us in situations where we experience very, very traumatic events. My dad, who we're going to be talking to shortly, at 18 years of age, landed on a beach where they were being shelled. Thousands of shells were coming per minute, and, and they were just being killed left and right. And my dad was a medic and it was his job to try to patch these guys up and then get them back to a hospital ship. 18, think about that. In fact, I have a picture I wanna share with you. Let's see if I can keep the glare off. There he is at 18 in his Navy uniform. He's a kid, he was a baby. I mean, I know when my son was 18, I did not think of him as a man. He was my son. He, he was a kid. And never would I have allowed him to experience anything traumatic and um, scary, right? We want to protect our children. We don't want them to have scary experiences. And yet, here was my dad at 18 while well, the rest of the 18 year olds were grabbing a burger and fries. And he was in the middle of one of the most frightening battle scenes of history. One of the most famous battles of history. And we don't experience something like that without getting traumatized, without getting scarred. And back then they didn't know as much as we know now. Now we know that that trauma, that scarring is called PTSD or post-traumatic distress disorder, PTSD, no, post, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and, and we know that it's something that doesn't just magically go away when you come home. It is affecting your mind. It is affecting what happens to you. And even when you are away from the place where the trauma happened, even when you're actually safe, the, the post-traumatic stress disorder, the reactions to it, the, um, what do I wanna say? The responses, the, I can't think of the, exactly the word I want, but how that PTSD manifests itself in your life, whether it's flashbacks, whether it's anxiety, whether it's inability to focus, 
uh, a change to speech patterns. There are many, many, oh, sleep disruption, very common. There are many things that happen that are the manifestations of the PTSD. And it takes help to get over it. Time isn't gonna heal it. You know, that's one of those old myths about grief too. Time heals all wounds, not true. Sometimes time makes things worse. So one of the things we're gonna talk about today and dad's battle cry today is get help. PTSD doesn't just magically go away. And I want to encourage anybody listening to this show, please stay with us because dad not only experienced some huge trauma during the war, he's experienced other trauma that we've been discussing. And uh, even last week, the threat of losing his life as he was having this stroke. And just this morning over coffee, we were talking because I'm here now. Uh, in my parents' home helping them, uh, we were talking about how really at the core of PTSD is um, fear of losing your life, right? That's the core, fear of death. And so anytime you come up against a situation, whether you're being mugged or you're in a battle, or a tsunami's coming your way. You know, there are many, many sources of PTSD. It isn't only about battle. It isn't only about the military. But anytime your life feels threatened and you think you could die, that's a trauma. And that trauma can lead to post-traumatic stress disorder haunting you for many years. In dad's case, 66 years before he got help. So please stay with us because we want to share with you what dad did and how you too can do better or, or actually heal from this PTSD if you're someone who's suffering from it. So stay with us. We will be right back. Okay, I want to say to my Facebook uh, live stream viewers that I do not have my stopwatch today and I was using my phone, so you're gonna be hearing this. It's not the best timer in the world, but it's the only one I seem to have available right now. Um, I'm just looking around real quick to see if there's anything else. Uh, oh, well, we'll give this another go. And uh, <laughs> I could always glance over there to the left. All right, so if you see that happening, you'll know I'm just doing my best to try and keep the time. I'm using my phone and you know how your phone screen goes blank. All right, so we're gonna get ready to start this again. Dad, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you so you'll be able to talk when the time comes. Okay, Dad, oh, you're not unmuted yet. All right, Dad, let's do a little quick test. Say hi to me. How are you, Paula? Oh, okay, <clears throat> good, very good. Okay, I'm gonna introduce you now, here we go. Welcome back to Change It Up Radio here with Paula Shaw. I'm very excited about my show today because my guest is my dad, Jack Gutman, who is a veteran. And we are one week away from Veterans Day and we wanna talk about so many things, but really at the core of it all is PTSD. Because my dad, who went into the military when he was actually 17 and a half, his father signed for him so he could go in early. Because remember, back of World War II, everybody was committed to go save the world. And, and there was honor in fighting in that war. So dad fought in that war. He was at both Normandy and Okinawa, the Okinawa invasion, which is pretty rare, by the way, and by some miracle lived through both experiences, and thank goodness, but suffered PTSD for 66 years, not saying anything to anybody, because when he was young, in fact, when he was training for the military duty, he did some training in a psych hospital. And back then, psych hospitals were kind of scary places. 
And he was afraid that if anybody knew the things that were happening to him, the nightmares and, and seeing the battle over and over again, he was afraid they'd put him in a psych hospital and that was a big terror for him. That was scarier than trying to live with it. But in spite of all that, he raised a family. Um, I have a brother and a sister, Leslie and Craig, my mother, Mary Jo Gutman. Uh, we are all a result of the fact that dad lived and that for all these years, he's been a great dad and a great husband. And somewhere along the way, he managed to find the time to write this book, which is the story of his life called One Veteran's Journey to Heal the Wounds of War. And that book is available on Amazon. So now without any further ado, let me introduce you to my dad, Jack Gutman. Hey, dad. Welcome. <clears throat> Thank you for having me on your show again. I've always enjoyed it because we can help reach people. And that's my main purpose. So uh, uh, I've had <clears throat> lots of great um, interviews with you. You've done a great job, Paula. Thanks. And I thank you for that. When we were talking about the um, post-traumatic stress, um, the one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that um, it's each person goes through PTSD. The, the veterans or trauma people, everyone goes through a different type of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's varied. Now, I remember once when I was getting ready to write my book, you asked me a question, what was your PTSD like? Mm -hmm. I said it was very dramatic and uh, I really don't want to talk about it. And you said, Maybe your people would like to know what it was like. So after a lot of uh, contemplation, I, I made up my mind that I finally put it into my book, which I did. <clears throat> and um, uh, just at this moment, I just want to mention a little bit of what I saw when I would go through the PTSD, beside the crazy things that I did, which were many, many uh, things that I'm uh, pretty much ashamed of. But the one but thing were, that I wanted ways, was, ways you were trying to cope with the pain and the, and the stuff that was difficult, right, Dad? I mean, that's what they were. They were coping mechanisms. It wasn't that you did things wrong. Right? You get that's right. Yeah. Go ahead. So go ahead with what you were saying. What, what I, in my bad times when I would wake up from a dream or a flash would happen, I would see the invasions over and over again and the bodies in the water and the body parts on the beach and all, but it would all be magnified, magnified. Mm -hmm. You would hear the, the men screaming that they need help and yelling mama, mama, all these things. They were all magnified. So these were things that some of them, just some very small things out of many that you go through when you're going through post-traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I think it might be a good idea for anybody who's never heard your interview before, tell them just a little bit about what it was like that day on June, June 6th, I believe, uh, 19... Yes. 44, was it? 1944? 19, 1944, yes, definitely. All right. So what, it was, was, um, what was it like that morning? You're an 18 year old kid. You've, you've had <laughs> some training, but you really had no idea what you were in for, right? Uh, right. But very quickly, we were supposed to make the invasion on the 5th, which was um, June 5th, but the waters were so rough. And so they decided. Eisenhower and the other generals decided to do it on June 6th. Mm -hmm. So that evening, mm -hmm. there were a lot of people. The, the ship I was on were very nice. They were giving people food and I mean, they are giving us food or whatever they wanted. But you're and, not uh, just food. They were giving you like whatever you wanted, correct? 
Yes, whatever whatever we wanted, they yeah. would do it. Because mm -hmm. uh, basically, um, and very honestly, there were a lot of us that were not going to make it that day. Exactly. And um, it was scary because, but it was it was sober to some people. Some people joked about it that uh, they always, basically, I personally, and I'm sure a lot of guys were the same way, they kept thinking, uh, yeah, there'll be people dying, but it's not going to be me. It's going to be him mm -hmm. or that person. And they thought the same thing about you. So that's the way it was. And I guess it's the way of coping for anxieties or whatever it may be. But uh, and some people react so differently uh, when they're uh, going to face death or the possibility of it. Sure. And that's the way it was. So a lot of people got sick the next day because we were going to hit the beach because of the uh, of what they ate or whatever the what happened, and they were throwing up in the in the boats. You're going down the nets when it all happens. We were supposed to go in very. Uh, three hours later, uh, and we were just to take care of wounded and uh, evacuate them and get them back to England. Uh, it was supposed to be what we thought a cakewalk. Did not work out that way. No. When we got there, there was shelling on the beach, mines all over the place, uh, ships and, and were being blown up, and LCV boats, the Higgins boats, that they carried the troops were all being, a lot of them got blown up by the posts where they had mines as you come into it. You had to, you didn't go up like we practiced in, in, in the uh, yeah, exactly. prior invasion. I know, Dad, one of the we things, would have one of the th hey, Dad, on the beach and, interrupt you for a second. One of the things you've mentioned when we've talked about this in the past, is that there were there were barriers that would not allow the boats to actually land on the sand the way they were supposed to. So yes. The men had to go off those boats into deep water with these heavy packs on. Right. So some this of is, them died even then, right? We, um, when those ramps would go down there, you're, deep, you're in water when you came out if the, and a lot of guys were shot as they came off of it, the guys in the early waves, even when we came in there, there was gunfire, but not as bad as when it was earlier. Right. But right. when you came down, you had to walk in, I, I was up to almost my chest walking in water mm -hmm. and you have your heavy packs. A lot of guys, which I found out why there were so many bodies in the water was because guys panicked that in the early waves, when the machine guns, which shot off 150 bullets a minute, were mm -hmm. mowing them down, they leaped off the side of the boat, and with the heavy packs, they went right down into deep water. If they couldn't get the packs off, they died. And that was traumatic. So I think the picture that you're painting is very clear. You, you're landing on a beach with shells being fired a zillion as you said 150 a minute or whatever 150 how many a lot of 100, 150 bullets a minute a minute by many big guns right and one right. of the things we've talked about before is those big guns were supposed to be taken out by aircraft but that didn't work out because of the cloud cover prevented them from really being able to see where to drop those bombs. That's right. So, what happened, it turned out the the cloud cover did cover the bunkers, which would have helped a great deal had they landed those thousand bombs or so on it. However, because they couldn't see it, they were trying to uh, uh, figure out, well, that, it's about there, but it landed one mile away from the bunkers. The bombs and, landed a mile away. A mile away yeah, so from that, the bunkers right. and left the all the soldiers hitting the beaches into the hands of the bunkers mm. and the Germans there. Right. Being shelled, bombed, mines going off. I think the picture is very clear and very terrifying. 
I mean, you know, when I think about the fact that you weren't the only 18 year old there, no. most of the guys were like 18, 19, maybe 20, because that's, that's the age of men that were being drafted to go to war. And, and you went into it believing there was glory and kind of a little bit of glamour and honor in defending your country, right? Right. And we, instead, now what you're seeing when you land on the beach is a nightmare. What people today might call a shit show, something really scary. And I think right there, Dad, we should pause because we need to take a little break. And then we will come back and talk about uh, the rest of what exactly happened. What, what were the experiences you had that formed this PTSD that you then lived with for many years after that? And we'll get right into that. And I wanna talk a lot too about your recent trauma, what's happened here and, and, and some of the things that we learned from that. So we will be right back from this break and we'll be talking some more with my dad, Jack Gutman, World War II veteran. We'll be right back. Okay, Dan, we're not really going to a break as I've explained to them, that'll all happen in the studio. So if you're ready, we will just start again. Okay. Are you, are you good, dad? Do you need drink of water or anything? <clears throat> Just quick one. Okie doke. You're doing great. <laughs> By the okay. way, Facebook live stream viewers, can you believe that a week ago he was having, he had a stroke and he could not speak. I mean, you're viewing a flat out miracle here. Okay, dad, let's get to it. Welcome back to Change It Up Radio here with Paula Shaw. And I'm so happy you're with us on this day because I have a very, very special guest with me. It's my dad, Jack Gutman, who's not only a veteran of the Normandy invasion, the Okinawa invasion, but he's also, as of last week, a veteran of a stroke. Yes, a week ago, my dad had a stroke and the biggest impact of that stroke was that he could not speak. And we're gonna be talking about what that was like for him and what's happened since and what he's learned in this upcoming segment. So dad, um, we were just finishing the discussion of Normandy and Okinawa and all of that. And I, I do have one question before we talk about what's happened with your stroke. How, how soon after the battle did you start experiencing what we would call the symptoms of PTSD? The nightmares, the flashbacks, all of that. <clears throat> well, actually it started when I got back to England with the wounded and we were taking care of the wounded for a little over a, a month, month and a half before they gave me leave to, uh, to go back to uh, New York City. Mm -hmm. And then I wound up, uh, I was starting to get some uh, pieces of it, uh, flashbacks, but I kept thinking it was like, they always used to say, you get what they call battle fatigue, but you'll get over it. And I kept thinking, well, I'm not happy with this, but I know I'll get over it, mm -hmm. but it didn't happen. No. And all the, way, all the way from that point on, all the way to my training with the Marines and, uh, and going to the Pacific in Okinawa, mm -hmm. it started getting worse at various times. Like for instance, if you weren't in a battle at that time, um, on alone you would, you would have flashbacks about that and what was happening to you too. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I never asked you this before, Dad, but something <laughs> just occurred to me. When you were going to Normandy, you really had no idea what was going to happen or what to expect. But when you were going to Okinawa, now you'd known the horror of an invasion. How did you feel? What were, what were you like emotionally? Do you remember? 
Yes, I kept thinking it was going to be very similar because I had no other alternative. I to or nothing to gauge in, uh, to gauge it by mm -hmm. uh, because all I had was Normandy, but right. and that was traumatic. It was something I just an eighteen year old mind wasn't set for. Yeah, and uh, when I was getting ready for the invasion there, it turned out there wasn't that much action on the beach. There was firing and all, but we, we took care of the wounded that we had. Mm -hmm. But when we got back, the key there was the Japanese kamikazes, which was brand new to me and frightening. Those are guys that were their one job is to have a bomb on a airplane and go one way and dive that plane into the ship, a ship, any ship they can get a hold of. Mm -hmm. And so it would explode it. And it was, I saw the battleship New Mexico, which was like a football field away from me. I was running to my battle station when the kamikaze planes hit. And this was a new thing for me. I saw a young pilot, Japanese pilot, come between me, our, our ship called the buoy, it was an APA, and the, the battleship New Mexico. I saw that for the first time in my life, another person take his own life. He went right into the, the bridge of the battleship New Mexico. There was a huge explosion and he killed, like we found out later, 80 sailors, including the captain. And I just stood there petrified. I could not understand someone giving up their life that one moment. That was a new thing for me. Yeah, I'll bet. And horrifying because it goes against everything that human beings are designed to do. We're designed to survive. We're designed to live. And so yes. for somebody to have the kind of mindset that they could do that, yeah, I could see Dad. You know, we've never really talked about that before, but it's pretty terrifying to think that they they could they were trained and they did that, right. and, and that was something that whew, could not be changed. You know, I neglected to mention when I introduced you too that you were a medic, so it was your job as an eighteen-year-old to patch up these wounded guys, to try to bandage them up, help them in every way you could so that you could get them back to the hospital ship and eventually to a hospital in England, right? Right. And so awesome. how much training had you had to be able to do that? Obviously you weren't a doctor. No, I got, um, I, I was sent to Bainbridge, Maryland where we took a six month course, which was like, uh, of a year, you know, mm -hmm. and we had to, we took training. I mean, it was six days a week. No, we had no leave. We had to study all the time. On Sunday, we would either study, and it was just an accelerated course where you learn many things, uh, battlefield wounds, uh, splints, and so forth like that. Mm -hmm. We had assisted in surgery, all kinds of different things. It was an accelerated course. And uh, you, you, what you have to do, we did things that lots of doctors do now. They did not, allow, they probably wouldn't allow some of that now. But mm -hmm. we did a lot of things, help with suturing up mm -hmm. the wounded, mm -hmm. assisting in surgeries and so forth. That basically was our accelerated training. Okay. So that's another thing we haven't really talked about too much in past interviews. But now I want to fast forward to the present day. Uh, last Wednesday, today is, is this Wednesday or Thursday? Today? It was, it was, the, 20, it was the 28th of yeah. October. And tell, and tell our, our listeners what happened. What did you experience? I was, I was getting ready to take my wife to the eye doctor and I got in my car like I always do. And, and she got in and we were driving out of the mobile home that we live, uh, the driveway. And I made the turn and I was going down toward a gate that 
comes at the end of that place where we make a right turn and then head right in toward the open gate. As we got to the end of that, before we made the right turn, it turned out that all of a sudden on the wall, it was just like, I, it was like, uh, Spark, it was like sparks and all that, but it was rays, rays going all over the place. And right in the middle, uh, I tell you, it was overwhelming. In the middle was a huge circle and it was beautiful blue and it had a dimension, like you could go right, like three dimensional, like you could go right through it. And I, I said to myself, or maybe I said aloud, wow. Yeah, mom. And my wife was there and she she said she saw my face just radiate. But I looked over at her and she said, Are you okay? And I tried to talk and I was uh, 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 exactly like that. As a matter of fact, I wound up, I couldn't talk for three hours. And so she, she was saying, uh, We got to go right back to the house. And I could I could hear it in my head, but I couldn't talk. I drove back to the house. She called the paramedics. They checked me over and they said, you've got a stroke. And they got me to a hospital that was uh, by, that had all that medicine. There was this medicine called TPA. And it's a special deal they give you in the vein. It's the a doctor clot said clot to me, buster, they call it a clot buster, right? But it's yes, like yes, it's thank you. Save you, or it's going to kill you. It's not a uh, simple right. thing. <laughs> well, when he said to me that I have to uh, find out from you, would do you want me to give you this because it could cure you, but it's very, very dangerous. I found that later it could kill you, but I had no choice. I just said. I nodded my head and he went ahead and did it. And so uh, for the next three hours, I was in, in a bed there at emergency while they were waiting to get me to ICU for two days. And uh, I'm sitting there and, and the nurse said, would you like to have your wife over? And I nodded and she said, you got the phone. So I showed her my phone because I couldn't talk. And she's talking to my wife and then when she asked her to come over, and then she was just ready to hang up. And then I, all of a sudden I said to her, thank you very much. And she went, oh my God, you're talking, you're talking, it's going to work. And next thing I know, words started coming to me. And I tell you, I mean it from my heart. I didn't want to leave my dear wonderful wife. And I was so glad that I was, looks like I was going to make it. Because uh, I don't know what that vision I had there with was, but I felt I was going to die. And uh, I had no idea what was going to happen in ICU because I was there for a couple of days. But I thank God and those wonderful doctors and nurses at that. St. Jude Hospital and what they yes. did. And Daddy, we need to go to a break right now. But when we come back, let's talk a little bit about, you know, what exactly you did experience, what you felt, and what brought you back. So we will get into that in just a moment when we come back from this break. Okay. And you know, Daddy, we're not really going to a break. So if, are you ready to, to do the next one? Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Ready? Yeah. Let me get a tip. <clears throat> I was tearing up on that last part too. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Here we go. Welcome back to Change It Up Radio here with Paula Shaw and my very special guest today, my dad, Jack Gutman. Many of you know he is a veteran of World War II and he is also the author 
of One Veteran's Journey to Heal the Wounds of War, which is available on Amazon. And he's been a great dad and husband to my mother, who is my actual mother, <laughs> my blood mother, for many, many years. I don't even know how many years you guys have been married, dad, but uh, I feel very blessed and lucky that both of my parents are living and they are my two parents. There's never been a divorce in all these years. If, if any of you are just joining us, we were just talking about the fact that one week, week and a day ago, my dad had a stroke. And the result of that stroke was that he could not speak. And he was taken to emergency. Fortunately, my mother knew to get into action quickly. So she called the paramedics. And for any of you that don't know this, it's very important if a drug called TPA, which is known as a clot buster, if that drug is going to help you, it has to be administered in the first three hours after the stroke. So it's very important to get a person who has had a stroke to the hospital as quickly as possible. So dad was just describing to us what it was like in the moment he had the stroke and we were discussing it earlier today. So dad, I'm just gonna recap for anybody who's just joining us. You were driving the car, you made a turn, you were kind of looking at a concrete wall that was in front of you. But then all of a sudden you saw like these rays of light beautiful rays of light and in the middle was a beautiful blue pool of light a big blue circle right right and and it was awe inspiring could you mom says your face started to glow and you went oh wow and but i think in in my personal opinion is there was a moment there where you could have gone into that circle and maybe we would have lost you to this plane, the earth plane. You would have gone on to another dimension. But, and one of the things we talked about the other night was when mom said to you, are you okay? What's going on? What are you experiencing? That kind of grounded you back to your life. Yes. back to what matters here. And we talked about some words that are really maybe part of that grounding. One is love, of course, um, responsibility. You know, when I, when I first saw you in the hospital that very first day, and the only one of us at a time could see you, and, and that was very fortunate because the restrictions, as you all know, with COVID are very, very, very strong. But the only time you teared up was when you told me after this happened and you thought about what if I die and your mother will be all alone. Yes. Remember that? True. So Very we're, true. we're looking at love, responsibility. Um, yes. You know, the, the connection is, it's, I kind of feel like you were almost there was the opportunity to go off into the ethers, but your love for her, when you looked at her, looked in her eyes and saw her concern for you, it grounded you back to your life, you know, kind of tethered your soul back into your body in a way. You know, that is so true because I, um, I, I didn't, I kept, how could I leave her like this? And, uh, hmm because I love her so much. We've been married 73 years. And, uh, and then my children. And then um, the one thing I've had for many years now that I've wanted to do is to touch lives. And I feel there's so many things, even at my age, going to be 95 and December 19th, that uh, I could help so many people. So yeah. there was so much there, I guess you would call it uh, dedication or service. Or, service. Uh, but the most important thing, I mean, my love for my wife, and it was so important. And I just, when I looked at her and all of a sudden, when I turned back, it was gone. Every, the vision was gone. It was like, when I thought back, 
in these last days, I just, I, I'm, I'm really thinking God ha had to be in it. And uh, I felt so, uh, I, I was ready to, this was the end of my life. I've had that happen to me in Normandy. Mm -hmm. I've had it happen when I had the act, uh, the guy hit our car in 2015 and we were trapped in there. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that was another thing where I went through post-traumatic stress thinking about that mm -hmm. and almost thought I was going to die then. Mm -hmm. And then this experience. So all of this brings out a, a little post-traumatic stress disorder also. You know, and and to almost think I almost died, but thanks to that medicine, God and those wonderful doctors and nurses, I'm alive right now. And so whatever days he's got, I'll be doing the best I can. And and what I think is so wonderful, Dad, is <clears throat> obviously I'm very happy that you are alive, but What's so beautiful about your life right now is that the cornerstone of it really is about how can I serve others? How can I spread the word to people suffering with PTSD to get help? You know, you just made a great point a minute ago. You, you suffered some PTSD when we were all in a car accident on Thanksgiving evening right. a few years back. Um, it, you suffered PTSD last week. Realize, yes. even we talked this morning, after you got home and read up about that drug and realized how dangerous it could be, in your case, it did the trick. And I mean, I don't think anybody listening to this interview would believe that a week ago you couldn't speak. Um, but, but PTSD, as we were discussing this morning, it uh, results from a trauma or many traumas that seem to be threatening your life. It's like, I might not live through this. Anything that happens to you, whether it's a car accident or a battlefield or a tsunami or an earthquake or whatever might happen being mugged or something like that, anytime your brain goes, oh my God, I might not survive this. That is an event that could cause PTSD. And you know, one of the things you were saying earlier that I love so much, Dad, you said everybody's PTSD experience is unique. Right. That's the same thing that's true of grief. And for years I've been saying PTSD is a form. It's an expression of grief. There's been a horrible loss here. Does that make sense to you? Absolutely. That, that is, with you nailed it on the head. You, you hit it right on the head when you said that. That is so true. And uh, and I talked when I went back to Normandy the last year to do that documentary, mm -hmm. talking to those veterans who made the invasion of Normandy with me at that time. We didn't know each other, but we got to know each other. It was seven, eight of us. They all brought the same kind of things that you're talking about. All experiences were different. Uh, the documentary will show that. And uh, so you, you really know that it is true. It's always different for each individual. Yes. And yes. Uh, they handled it in their own way. By the way, some of them still haven't gotten over it, you know. And that brings up a really important point, Dad. At one point in time, you finally made a decision to get help. It began when you attended my grief group back then, but then you right. continued on. You went to the VA and, and Dylan Bender right. worked with you uh, in therapy to help you dissolve the pieces of the trauma, correct? Yes, he was so patient with me. As a matter of fact, when they did the first treatment, I. He said to me, uh, I mean, I, I wound up crying and everything. And he said, all of these trauma things you're going through in your brain are just like big ice cubes that will be eventually melted down. And someday you'll be able to talk about it and everything else. 
But I couldn't believe that. And then he said, I'll see you next week. And I was thinking to myself, the heck you will. I don't want to go through this. But I had gone through so much. And thanks to you getting me to that point, because I wasn't going to go even to the veterans till I went through your grief thing. And that helped me so much to stop drinking and so forth. So my whole life changed, starting with you and then Dylan Bender. He was the most patient man. And so almost three years, we went through a lot of stuff. But I came up with a new life. And I, I say it over and over again, you veterans that are going, or people, you don't have to be a veteran. You're going through any kind of trauma or post-traumatic stress disorder, get help. Believe me, there is hope. I don't care how you feel, there's hope. I never believed I would have a new life, and I do. I've got a wonderful children and family and wife, and all came because I decided to make that decision. Do that. Dad, I don't think there's a better way that we could end this show than what you just said. That was beautiful, and it was right on the money. So bless you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, God, that he's here. And to my listeners, thank you for being with us today. Please share this show. Please get it to as many people as you can, because there are so many people suffering with PTSD out there. And there, there is help. There is hope. But you have to take action. So don't forget, you'll hear us on Sunday evenings at 9 o'clock on AM 1170 and 96.1 FM. We're also on every major podcast platform. So it's easy to share this show with your friends. And don't forget to visit changeitupradio.com and paulashaw.com. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Dad. Bless you. I love you. God bless you. (laughs)